Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, staff, and students at Zaytuna College, I'd like you to welcome all of you to the commencement ceremony of our graduating class of 2023, which has now begun, so please be seated. Honored guests, esteemed faculty, our board, proud parents, and our remarkable students, graduates now of Zaytuna College's 10th commencement ceremony. I'm humbled to stand before you today amidst the captivating beauty of our campus, adorned with its gardens and trees, as we celebrate the culmination of your educational journey. In the essence of Zaytuna, the Arabic word for olive, we find a profound metaphor that encapsulates the purpose of our noble institution. Just as the olive tree serves as a symbol of resilience, enlightenment, and sustenance, Zaytuna College seeks to restore the centrality of knowledge in the Islamic tradition, while embracing the cultural currents shaping our modern world. As we embark upon this momentous occasion, let us turn to the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The example of his light is that of a niche in which there is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass. The glass looks like a brilliant star. It's lit by oil of a blessed tree, the oil which is neither eastern nor western. In this verse, we discover a rich tapestry of symbolism. The niche represents the human soul, while the lamp signifies the divine knowledge that resides within it. The glass, like a shining, brilliant star, reflects the human intellect a vessel ready to receive and radiate wisdom. And within this lamp, burning bright, is the oil derived from the blessed olive tree, an emblem of knowledge, truth, and guidance. So that concludes the speech that was created by ChatGPT. <laughs> so I was telling one of our staff <laughs> yesterday that we had a long board meeting yesterday which some people think is spelled B-O-R-E-D, um, but it's actually not. Um, and I was really exhausted. I said, oh, I've got, I've got to write some words. Oh, she said, oh, chat GPT will do that for you. So I said, really? She said, yeah, I'll send it to you. So she sent me three different speeches. They were all reasonably good, which deeply troubled me. <laughs> uh, and I'm wondering how many college presidents today are giving chat GPT speeches. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who I actually met once um, and asked him if he thought the grand chessboard was still a valid um, thesis, and he said, ah, there's more proof for it now than there was when I wrote it. Well, he actually wrote a book in 1967 called Between Two Ages, and in that book he said the Third American Revolution, which the first is obviously begins in 1776, the second is the Industrial Revolution, but the third he called the Tektronic Revolution, which was the merging of technology uh, and electricity. So he said the Third American Revolution highlights the sharp contrast between our technical success and our social failure. And it raises basic questions concerning the control and direction of the thrust of technological innovation. How are choices made? Why are they made? By whom are they made? What values are involved in these choices and how can they be crystallized so that a coherent policy can be shaped? These questions increasingly beset all modern societies, but given the extensive social scope of contemporary American science and technology, this challenge is especially important in the United States because it affects and potentially threatens the most intimate aspects of American life. Since it appears true that this society has chosen to emphasize technological change as its chief mode of creative expression and basis for economic growth. It follows that the society's most imperative task 
is to define a conceptual framework in which technological change can be given meaningful and humane ends. Unless this is done, there is a real danger that by remaining directionless, the third American revolution, so pregnant with possibilities for individual creativity and fulfillment, can become socially destructive. So, something to think about. I probably could have gotten away with my chat GPT speech and everybody would have said, ah, it was okay. Uh, so, how do we deal with that? Well, part of it is that we, we have to think deeply. We have to think about what technology is doing and how, where it's taking us. But we have to think deeply and thinking demands effort. In fact, in our tradition, deep thinking is called ishtihad, which is the expenditure of the utmost effort that we have, yishtahidu. It's also related to yujahidu, which is jihad, intellectual jihad. We forget about that, that there is an intellectual jihad to think deeply about things, but also to use our intellects to defend the most important things, just as the, the military jihad is to, f to defend a state, to defend its borders against invaders. Intellectual jihad is to defend the mind against the invaders of the mind. And they're everywhere today. They're in our homes. We turn them on daily. But to think deeply and freely necessitates one mind, one's mind being free of four things. Ego, which we call nafs. Ulterior motives, which we call hawa. Delusion, which we call dunya. And malevolent insinuations, which we call shaitan. Without freeing one's heart from these four enemies, we don't stand a chance. But I would add to them a fifth enemy illiberal thinking, which is related to all four. And it's necessary for all four to succeed. What do I mean by illiberal thinking? I mean the thought which is done without the arts that free one to deliberate, which comes from a beautiful Latin uh, compound, de and libere, to weigh in the balance to weigh in the balance. In other words, to reckon with the outcomes, to determine whether a choice is a good one, does it benefit, or does its harm outweigh its benefit? This is called maslaha and mafsada. It's the foundation of our tradition in looking at what is beneficial and what is harmful. Because our tradition says to follow what is beneficial and to avoid what is far harmful. How do, what are the sound scales? Why does God say, وَزِينُ بِرْقُسْتَاسِ mustaqim? Way with an upright scale. Imam al-Ghazali, in his brilliance, wrote a book of logic called al-Qustas al-Mustaqim. That reason is that scale that God has given us, but reason enlightened by revelation. Nurun ala nur. Light upon light. The light of reason when it is illuminated by the light of revelation. Through sound reason, we can weigh a proposition in the scales of free thought to determine if it's worthy of its pursuit. Then, if necessary, one can, through the art of rhetoric, persuade others of the soundness of that course or of the dangers and the perils. These five enemies are lurking in one's mind or heart during the deliberation. One loses one's way and hence one's ability to weigh. We have only introduced you to these arts of freedom, you graduates. We've, you've been introduced to them. You're not masters of them. We're not masters of them. We're still studying them. They're a lifelong study. The subtleties of language and literature through the mastery of grammar become clearer and more distinct the more one learns. The fallacies and fallacies, follies of so much human thought reveals itself through the mastery of dialectic and finally the beauty of effective language skillfully used for the common good. Shakespeare in his autobiographical character Prospero, most of uh, Shakespearean scholars say that Prospero represents him. It's his last play, The Tempest. He says of the liberal arts and Prospero, 
Prospero, the prime duke, being so reputed in dignity and for the liberal arts without parallel, those being all my study. So if you want to know why Shakespeare's great and still read in so many places, he was a master of the arts. He had his genius, but he was a trained genius. When Caliban, the, uh, the savage in the play, uh, advises Stefano and Trincolo about overcoming, uh, overcoming Prospero, he says to them, remember to first possess his books, for without them he's but a sot. This is how the same demons achieve the usurpation of power from the Muslims. Possess their books, especially their book, for without it they're but sots. As the great German Juris Freyer stated, study conceives knowledge, but knowledge gives birth to love, love to likeness, likeness to community, community to strength, strength to worthiness, worthiness to power, and power makes miracles. This is the route to the goal of magical accomplishment, both divine and natural. Well, we have something called mafum and mukhalifa, which is to look at what the opposite uh, meaning, because it gives you an understanding. So if we reverse this, neglect of study leaves one in ignorance. Ignorance gives birth to hate. Hate gives birth to differences, differences to social fragmentation, social fragmentation to powerlessness, and powerlessness to abject humiliation, and abject humiliation to utter failure. Our path lies in the pursuit of knowledge, which prophetically was determined to be from the cradle to the grave. Restoration of community remains our most urgent imper imperative. But we can only form real communities to the extent to which we can communicate, share common ideas and purposes. As one of my teachers stated, where men lack the arts of communication, intelligent discussion must languish. Where there is no mastery of the medium of exchanging ideas, ideas cease to play a part in human life. When that happens, men are but little better than brutes they dominate by force and cunning, and they will soon try to dominate each other in the same way. Loss of freedom follows. Again, to paraphrase him, we are under the illusion today that we have a liberal society, but it is a false liberalism that confuses authority with tyranny, that arises when people assume that everything is simply a matter of opinion, that doctrine, that, doctrine, that everything is simply a matter of opinion is suicidal. It will result in the doctrine of might makes right. When we free ourselves from reason rather than through it, we surrender to the only other arbiter in human affairs force. He says, the political implications of the liberal arts are not far to seek. If democracy is a society of free men, it must sustain and extend liberal education or perish. Democratic citizens must be able to think for themselves. To do this, they must first be able to think and have a body of ideas to think with. Shakespeare clearly understood this, and I've repeated this before, but it's, it's worth it. For tyranny to flourish, the population must be deprived of the arts of liberty. In Henry VI, Shakespeare writes this speech, and this is from tyranny. Thou hast most traitorously corrupted the youth of the realm by erecting grammar schools. And whereas before, our forefathers had no other books but the score and the tally, consumerism, thou hast caused printing to be used, and contrary to the king, his crown and dignity, thou hast built a paper mill. In other words, the spread of knowledge. Reading and writing look to that man like treason. We find this in the archetypal tyrant of the Quran, the most repeated story in the Quran. When Allah says, فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُهُ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمًا فَاسِقِينَ Dr. Cleary in, in his often brilliant diction, word choice, says, thus he made his people flippant. So I looked up flippant just to, I, I, you always have to look up these words because we learn them very often in context. It is a quality that is personified in levity, which is lightness. And that's exactly what the Quran says. He made them light. He made them khafif. He made them flippant. 
He made them people of entertainment. He took away their gravitas. What do, gravitas, from the Latin weighted down. Gravity, it weights you down. What did Allah call our species? A thakalan, the weighty ones. That's what we are. The ins and the jinn are the two weighty ones. Thus he made his people flippant, and they went along with that, for they were indeed a dissolute people. Tyrants in the past used armies to control their people. They don't need armies anymore. They have armies of public relations teams, PR firms, propagandists, advertisements. One of the reasons the political science Hobbes looked askance at democracy was, according to him, it had the tendency to degenerate into an oligarchy of orators. Today, it would be sound bites on TikTok. Not TikTok. <laughs> Sub TikTok is good. TikTok is bad. Right? I asked the clock how things were going. He said, TikTok. The only force that can oppose this tendency is the critical capacity of the citizenry. This can only occur if they are liberally educated, but I will say more, the more educated quote unquote in a system that indoctrinates rather than truly educates, the less they are susceptible to propaganda. This is one of Chomsky's valid points that the, the most uneducated people in America tend to be the, the least susceptible to the propaganda. You've been introduced into a dying form of education that needs to be revived. John Kennedy, the, the former president, assassinated, gave a speech in front of the American Newspapers Publishers Association, and he said, without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even to anger public opinion. We need to be able to discuss the momentous events and ideas that affect us and our societies with intelligence and forbearance. This is only done in the spirit of philia, brotherly love. This is why the first capital of the US was named Philadelphia which is where our wonderful commencement speaker today is from, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, which is now over 10% Muslim. Our prophet said, none of you truly believes until he or she, he but understood to be he or she, loves for his or her fellow man. He said brother, but all of our commentators say it means brother in humanity. Until you love for your brother, what you love for yourself. We need more brotherly love, more community, but most importantly, more family, because that's, that's where it begins. And without that, we have no hope. So leave Zaytuna when you're in your bodies, but not in your hearts. Be people of decorum, be people of dignity, be people that carry themselves, comportment to carry yourself with dignity. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have ennobled the children of Adam. Be noble people. Don't be flippant people. Don't be glib people. Don't be people that go to the easy choices. Think deeply about the things that confront you. Be able to say, I don't know. But most importantly, Make your prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa proud of you on the day of judgment. Because he said, I want to be proud on the day of judgment. Inni mubahin bikum. 
I want, I'm going to be proud of my community on the day. Be amongst those people that he's proud of because there are people that he calls them to his hold and the angels say, no, they changed after you. Suhqan wa ba'da. Don't be amongst those people. Be people that our Prophet is proud of. And in conclusion, two things from the Quran that I want to remind you of, and then I'll, we have... Uh, the, the first is this dunya is tribulation. Imam al-Junaid, who you all know now, who he was if you didn't before you came here, he said, dunya daru hammin wa ghammin wa bala'an wa fitna. This is an abode of stress, of tribulation, of strife, and, uh, and he said, if you understand that, you will be grateful and you will be patient. If you lose that understanding, you will get frustrated with this world because it's a frustrating place for the people that don't have that knowledge. So, am hasibtum an tadkhur al-jannah wa lamma ya'tikum mathru al-ladina khadu min qabrikum مَسَّتْهُمَ الْبَأْسَاءَ وَضَرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعْهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ أَلَا إِنَّ النَّصْرَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ Or think you that you will enter paradise while such trials will not come to you as they came to those who were before you. They were touched by poverty and hardship and were shaken until even the messenger and those who believed with him said, when will the help of God come? Yes, certainly the help of God is near. So... It's always going to be near. So just remember that. And the second one, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُنُوا قَوَّمِينَ بِالْقِسْطِ شُهَدَاءَ لِلَّهِ وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوَ الْوَارِدَيْنَ وَرَقَرَبِينَ Be, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses. But never forget that justice must always be tempered by mercy. And our Prophet was a merciful Prophet before he was a just Prophet. Allah did not say, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا عَدْرًا أَوْ عَدَالَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ He could have. He was sent first and foremost as a mercy. But we need justice. And we're in a, a world often uh, defined by injustice. So be people who are just to the point where they're willing to testify against themselves. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.